Hello everyone, we are going to begin discussing chemical bonds today. Before we proceed though, I need you to become more familiar with two terms that I know you have heard before. They are compound and molecule. If you've ever watched Spongebob or Phineas and Ferb, I know they've used these terms before. My kids have learned them since they were like three years old. All right, but do you actually know what they mean? All right, so let's begin there. A compound is going to refer to a substance that is made of at least two or more different elements that are bound together. So regardless of what type of bond holds these elements together, if you have at least two different elements bound together, it's going to be called a compound. So two examples would be salt, sodium chloride, and water, H2O. I could also throw a different one at you. All right, give you C6H12O6. All right, and that would be glucose that is made during photosynthesis. So obviously we have three different elements bound together. Now the next term, molecule, is going to refer to elements or atoms being held together specifically by the first type of bond we're going to talk about today, and that is a covalent bond. Now with a covalent bond, I could have two of the same element, like O2 making oxygen that we breathe. I could have hydrogen gas because that's also held together by covalent bonds. I could have chlorine gas, all right? Or I could have glucose again, C6H12O6, all right? Because we're gonna learn shortly that those three elements would also be held together by covalent bonds. Up here, salt though, that will not be held together by covalent bonds, so that could not be a molecule. So let's proceed and learn what really makes something be held together by a covalent bond. All right, so what a covalent bond is going to be is it's going to represent the sharing of electrons between two or more elements. And all those elements must be nonmetals only. So our focus right now is only going to be in the elements that are on the right-hand side of the periodic table, in particular groups 14 through 17 not group 18, the noble gases, because they're already stable. So we're going to look at the sharing of electrons between elements that are non-metals only. And the way it's going to work, and I've said this before, is you have to do one electron for one electron sharing, period. So if an element, for example, hydrogen here, has just one electron, and I want to bind that with another hydrogen the way i would show that is they're going to come together they're going to go one for one so they can each get two if i were to draw that bond and i'm going to draw the next one here as an empty circle so you can see the difference each hydrogen now has two electrons that they're sharing simultaneously they're both happy all right you cannot give one electron as i've said and take five others from another element it doesn't work so for all the elements involved, they have to be able to go one for one, sharing electrons, and also fill their outer valence shell. If one element cannot fill its outer valence shell, then it will not be held together by a covalent bond. All right, so let's look at some examples down below here in this little animation. All right, so I'm going to show you how to draw this both using energy levels and Lewis dot structures, but... I'm going to rely mainly on the Lewis dot structures because as you've seen, hopefully, they are easier to do than drawing all the rings. All right, it's less work as well. Right now in this little animation, you see of uh, several different molecules being formed together because all of these would be covalent bonds here. Every single thing you see here, the hydrogens, the chlorines, the carbons, the oxygens, they're all non-metals so they can form covalent bonds. Now, what you're not seeing is every possible ring. So for chlorine, the two chlorines binding together, you only see the outer valence ring or outer valence shell, which is their third energy level. Chlorine has the atomic number of 17. It needs one more electron to become stable in its third energy level. So the two chlorines are going one for one, each sharing one, so they can get a total of eight and reach their octet. So that's the key thing. So each element, no matter if it's using the first, second, or third energy level, their outer valence shells, when they overlap, 
they have to be able to become filled in order to become stable. So if I start here and I look at two fluorines, all right, so here's where I'm at right now. Again, fluorine normally has two electrons in the first energy level and seven in the second. That's what we're looking at right now with these two fluorines, so fluorine A and fluorine B. They each have seven electrons. Now, when they overlap their outer energy level, I'm going to color this one a little bit darker here. They're going to go one for one. So here's that really dark one from fluorine A. And the one right below it is this one from fluorine B. They're pairing them up, going one for one. And now each fluorine is going to have a total of eight electrons in its outer valence shell. So I'm just going to do this once on one of the fluorines. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. It has now become stable and it is happy. And you can do the same thing for the fluorine on the left. When you go around, you're going to count eight simultaneously. And this one is happy. So that would be a molecule that is now being held together by a covalent bond. It's just one bond, which we will call a single bond. One electron for one electron. So one electron pair being shared. If we go down below, we have two hydrogens binding with one oxygen. Remember, hydrogen only has one electron, so that's what you're seeing for each of those two hydrogens. They only need one more. Well, oxygen, all right, you see right now it has one, two, three, four, five, and six electrons. It needs two more to become stable in its second energy level to get those two it's going to bind with two hydrogens. So these two are going to bind one for one. These two are going to bind one for one. And when all is said and done, if I color this one in really dark, let's pretend that's the electron from that hydrogen. And let's pretend this is the electron from the other hydrogen. If I go around, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for oxygen. It's happy. And now each hydrogen only needs two electrons, right? So one, two, it's happy. One, two, it's happy. And now we have a molecule that is held together by covalent bonds. And it's also a compound because you have two different elements, oxygen and hydrogen. Again, you, the idea here is you're going one electron for one electron in order to fill the outer valence shells. Here's some more examples again. We have water in the top left. I have ammonia in the top right. NH3 would be the formula here. In these diagrams, you are seeing all possible energy levels. So nitrogen has two electrons in the first energy level. And then it would normally have, what, five in the second. It would need three more electrons. So let's say that these that I'm coloring in right now are the electrons from hydrogen. Hydrogen will share one of its t with one of nitrogens to get two. And then nitrogen now again has, if you go around and count, here would be two electrons, four electrons, six electrons, and eight electrons. It's stable. Down below, we have methane, which is CH4. If I were to draw the Lewis dot structure, just so you get a better idea for carbon, it has six total electrons, two in the first, and then one, two, three, four in its outer valence shell. Well, each hydrogen only has one. So the four hydrogens I have are going to want one more electron each, and the one carbon I have is going to want four more electrons. So if I come to the diagram, and let me color in the hydrogens, one lone electron in blue and they're going to pair up with one electron from carbon now each of the four hydrogens has two electrons and if you go around and count this whole ring you will count eight electrons for carbon and it has now reached its octet now it takes a little time to draw all these rings with electron configurations which is why we're going to rely more heavily on lewis dot structures 
So here, we're going to form what we call in the first example here, so let's say example A, we're going to form what we call hydrogen bromide. Bromine has seven outer valence electrons. If you were to find that on the periodic table, you would see that it is in the 17th group, so it has seven outer valence electrons. It needs one more. Hydrogen needs this one more, so when you pair them up, look how much easier this is. You can now see that hydrogen here has two electrons, so it's stable. And then if you count around the full ring for bromine, it now has two, four, six, and eight. It's reached its octet. It's now stable. So look how much easier that was than having to draw all those rings, right? So that's why we're going to be really focused on drawing it this way. Sulfur, in example B, has six outer valence electrons, so it needs two more to become stable. Well, it's going to bind with two separate hydrogens. Line them up. So if we were to draw the Lewis dot structure normally for sulfur, you and I, we learned like this. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So ours looks a little bit different than what you're seeing in this diagram, but now when we start to draw bonding, it's not really going to matter. Because I want to see that I'm going to be able to fill these two spots where I need electrons. So regardless of how you overlap them, when you come over here to your diagram, I should be able to see that each hydrogen has two electrons. And then sulfur will now reach its octet. Again, two, four, six, eight. All the math works out. We've stabilized the outer valence shell. And if I come down to the two nitrogens below, now here it gets a little weird. Nitrogen, all right, has five valence electrons, all right, because it is in the 15th group, all right. It needs three more. Well, two nitrogens can bind with itself, and as long as they go one for one, one for one, and one for one, they're going to do what we call a triple bond. So I'm sharing three electrons to get three electrons, and that's now going to give me a total of eight. That's actually a very strong bond. The more bonds or more pairs of electrons you're sharing, the stronger the bond is. And it's very difficult to break that type of molecule apart. So again, here is one pair being shared, two pairs being shared, and three pairs being shared. All right, so it is okay to do this. So normally I would have one, two, three, four, five, all right, valence electrons for one nitrogen. If I have to drag all these over so I can make a triple bond in between, that's okay, as long as I'm accounting for all of the electrons.